Good morning, church. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How good it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity and worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And that's what we're here to do this morning. Uh, before we begin our worship, though, I just want to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we have our church picnic coming up uh, on Sunday the 27th of June, and that will be starting at lunch. We just ask people to bring their own lunch along, and then we'll have a great time of fellowship and games. It will be at the Southside Park or Riverside Park, and so everyone is invited to come to that. It should be a great time of fellowship together and just celebrating the past ministry year. Uh, also, starting in July and through July and August, we're going to have a Wednesday prayer night, and it's going to be at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays, sort of following through with what uh, some of the Wednesday prayer nights we had in the spring. Uh, but this time, we're going to specifically be focusing on the witness of the church in our local evangelism and global missions. It's just helpful, I think, sometimes to uh, have a focus when we decide to come and pray together. So please consider coming to that. You don't have to sign up. And even if you can only come once in a while, uh, just anyone who, uh, who would like to is invited to come for prayer. I think it's important uh, that as a church, though of course we have different groups praying at different times, that we have a specific time where we devote our time to prayer. And then finally, too, we have our semi-annual meeting coming up Sunday, July 11th. And our semi-annual meetings usually just happen right after the second service. Uh, they're not super long. It's kind of just giving a few updates about our ministry and what's coming. And so we would just invite you, particularly if you're a member of the church, to, to come to stay afterwards. Or uh, if you're going to be at the first service, to come back probably around 12, 15, 12, 30, we'll start. And uh, we'll just be able to hear about some of the things the Lord has been doing in the past half a year in our ministry and what's ahead for us. So please uh, come to that if you can. And then finally, too, I just want to take this opportunity as we're talking about ministry, just to show a bit of appreciation for those who have served this past ministry year from September to June. I think it's important that every once in a while we recognize those who have served in formal ways in the church and to praise God for that. So I just wanna take a moment to do that. And uh, I just wanna first of all, recognize our church council, our elders and our deacons. This has been a difficult year to be a leader and yet our elders and deacons have led prayerfully uh, seeking the Lord's wisdom, uh, desiring to have a spirit of unity, and ultimately, even in strange times, to nevertheless continue moving forward in our mission to make disciples. And I'm just so thankful for these uh, group of men whom God has put together in our leadership and how we've been able to, I think, do that uh, and see our mission and our ministry continue on. So thank you to our elders and deacons for serving so faithfully this year. I also want to uh, recognize and thank the Lord for our church staff, for our associate pastor, Joe. We were just talking. He just had, uh, at the beginning of June, his one-year anniversary here. He only knows ministry at Church of the Open Bible during COVID. And so he's done a phenomenal job, nevertheless, with those challenges, connecting with people, ministering to the youth and others in the church. So I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for uh, Alin as well, our children's director, and obviously there's been all kinds of ups and downs. We have a quip class, we can't have a quip class, things moving, and yet she has just rolled with the punches and done a phenomenal job uh, continuing to minister to kids, do the discipleship group, uh, put some things online, and so, so thankful for her. Thankful for Darla and all that she has done in so many ways, especially all of our online presence. So much of that, all of that really is due to her and her diligence and her skills. Thankful for that, for Ray and uh, as our bookkeeper and the work he does, for Betty and Corny as well, um, who keep the church clean. Thank you to them. I also want to thank those who have uh, helped with the welcome desk, door openers, ushers, cleaners, some new and necessary jobs during this time. And a lot of them maybe are, are overlooked and we don't even realize how important their work has been this year uh, to keep everything clean and safe. Thank you. Thank you to the pandemic committee too, who did a lot of the legwork to find out the information that the council needed to make decisions uh, during this year on what to do under different circumstances. Uh, they did a lot of work behind the scenes scenes. Thank you too to the music leaders, the sound guys, the pro presenter people. Um, you know, they always do a great job leading us in music, but uh, there's been extra work recording and thank you for your willingness to serve in that way. Our worship committee too, our decorating committee who puts a lot of thoughtfulness into the decorating of the church. 
Uh, I want to thank, too, our equip class teachers. And similar with Alin, you've just had to have so much flexibility this year and roll with the punches as things change. And yet your heart to minister to the young people, the children of this church has continued. And thank you for that ministry. And I would say the same for our life group leaders, our youth leaders. Thank you for your service this year uh, in unusual times. Thank you to our missions committee who last fall was able to put on a missions conference, even in the midst of a pandemic. And I think we were one of the few churches who actually were able to do that. And it was just a, a wonderful time, well attended, uh, able to pray for our missionaries and have many of them with us. Thank you to our Friendship Builders Committee, and especially more recently in the, in the spring, putting together some wonderful fellowship opportunities, bowling nights, that sort of thing, that really were, were helpful in building our, us as a community. Thank you to the Ladies Committee and Project Care, which is related to that. And uh, you did so much this year. And with a very small group, a lot of new leaders, and yet you've really stepped up and made it possible for the women of the church to minister, uh, to minister to them, to fellowship together, to grow. Thank you for that. Taking care of those in need through Project Care. Uh, men's Bible study leaders. Um, it wasn't possible for Joe and I to really have time to lead that, but uh, some of our elders and others stepped up to lead that. Thank you. Our library helpers. Our finance committee is always so diligent and does such a wonderful work with integrity with our finances, our Christian education and joy club, uh, those who volunteered for funerals and just anyone else that I missed who uh, was involved in some any formal way in our service and ministry of the church. Thank you and let's just praise God uh, for the gifts that he's given our church, the gifted people who serve. But finally, too, I just want to thank everyone, because I know and trust that everyone in our church um, has had other, even if not serving in formal ways like that, I trust are serving informally just by ministering to each other daily and calling each other, praying for each other, encouraging one another. It's a blessing to see. And uh, let's just take some time to thank God for the service in this church, to ask him to help us to be serving one another even more faithfully in the summer and in the ministry year to come. And uh, let's begin our worship now that way. Lord, we do thank you again for this opportunity to come and worship you on the Lord's day. And we want to praise you for all that you are and all that you've done. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. And Lord, we are especially thankful this morning as we consider the ministry of this church and all of those who have faithfully served in this church this past ministry year from September here into June. Thank you, Lord, for gifting uh, d each of us in different ways and for the willingness to use our gifts in different ways to serve the church. And Lord, we know Paul said it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I trust that that was true for all of those who served in these different ministries this year. And I pray that this summer, as things slow down a little bit, it would be a time of rest and rejuvenation so that we would be ready to go in the, in the new year in September and uh, begin our ministries again. Lord, we just thank you that you are faithful to your church. And again, you faithfully give us the gifts and gifted people necessary for our ministries. Lord, I also just thank you for all of the informal ways that members of this church serve one another. And Lord, it's too many to count. We know there's so much going on behind the scenes, so many ways that we seek to love each other with the love of Christ and build each other up. Thank you for that. Please encourage everyone in that. I pray especially for those who serve by faithfully praying for our church. And I know there are many people, especially many seniors, who, Lord, express how they aren't able to serve uh, in some of the ways they used to because of some health concerns or, or different reasons. And yet they are faithful prayer warriors who are upholding the church and the people of the church and the ministry. And Lord, thank you for them. Bless them in that. And I just ask now, Lord, that you would help us to grow as servants because we know, Lord, that Jesus said the greatest of all is the servant of all. And of course, Jesus is that example. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. And so, Father, help us to have that same attitude as those who have been served by Christ and who have been saved by him because of his self-sacrifice for us. Lord, I pray too that you would particularly now uh, this week, show us how we can serve each other, how we can serve those in need, those who are grieving, that we would be a comfort to them. Uh, for those, Lord, who are maybe experiencing difficulties in their families or in relationships, Lord, we'd come alongside and encourage and pray for them. Those who might be sick or having other health concerns, that we would be 
uh, supporting and serving them as well. And also, Lord, we want to be serving our neighbors, our community, particularly by being an example of Christ's likeness and by having opportunities to share the hope of Christ with them. Help us also to be servants to our missionaries who are spread out all over the globe seeking to reach the unreached with the gospel. Help us to pray them for them and encourage them too, Lord. We ask too that you would now forgive us in ways that we have been selfish, how we have so often thought of ourselves and not of others as well. Help us to have the attitude again of Christ, that we would not look out for only our own interests, but the interests of others and be humble servants as he has served us. Forgive us, Lord, for how we fail in this and equip us by your spirit to do what you've called us to do, to minister in our church and elsewhere for the good of each other and for your glory. And we pray all these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, our call to worship this morning is Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I thought this would be a fitting call to worship because as you'll see later, uh, it really fits in well with the uh, passage we're going to be looking at in the sermon. But also that this would be uh, our confession. This is David's confession when he had sinned. Uh, against Bathsheba and her husband. And as I read this, let this be our confession as well, so that we can then approach the Lord with a clear conscience and draw near to him in fellowship as we experience his continued forgiveness. So Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Well, with that confession before us, let's respond now in singing. Singing praise to our God who forgives us of all of our iniquities and restores to us the joy of our salvation. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you, we turn to you. face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us worthy of all Welcome you here. 
Now, through the preaching of his word, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Several weeks ago, when we were working through the first section of Ephesians 4, we discovered that the local church is to have an every member ministry. 
that Christ has designed the church to grow and mature when gifted people, and specifically he mentions pastors, teachers, when they don't do all the ministry of the church, but rather equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 12 to 13. And that is the biblical bl blueprint for how the church is supposed to function. All of us doing our part, ministering to one another in Christ-like love as we are equipped through the preaching and teaching of God's word. And it's such a beautiful design, isn't it? A group of people from very different walks of life, nevertheless united in Christ and committed to serving one another just as Christ has served us. And I take it that's why so many over the past while have commented about this very thing, telling me how much they appreciate the idea of an every member ministry church. Well, considering those positive comments, and even more so my own growing conviction that one of the greatest needs for the church today is a recovery of this every member ministry. I've decided that for the next two weeks, we're going to consider this matter further. And specifically, two areas of mutual ministry that are badly neglected, I think, in our day. The ministry of restoration and burden bearing, which we find side by side in Galatians 6, verses 1 to 2. In Galatians 5, verse 13, the Apostle Paul exhorted the Christians in the church of Galatia to serve one another, going on to explain then the purpose of this mutual ministry in verse 14 to 15, that it fulfills the law of love, and then the power for mutual ministry in verses 16 to 26, namely the Holy Spirit. In chapter 6 now, he, he gives two specific examples of serving one another. And we're going to look at the first this morning. The mutual ministry of restoration, which we see in chapter 6, verse 1. So serve one another. How? Well, here's one way. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. You know, after 40 years or so of, of being a Christian, and especially 15 or so years in pastoral ministry, I can say without a doubt that the greatest heartaches have come from witnessing fellow believers in Christ fall into sin, or worse, fall away from the Savior. That has brought the greatest sadness and pain in my heart. As pastor and author J.C. Ryle lamented well over a century ago, a stranded ship, an eagle with a broken wing, a garden covered with weeds, a harp without strings, a church in ruins. All these are sad sights, but a backslider is sadder still. I'm sure we're all familiar with that sadness, with that pain to some degree or another, whether it is through the experience of knowing a backslidden family member or, or church member or Christian friend. And I'm equally sure that we've all wondered in those situations, what am I supposed to do? What do I do when I see a fellow brother or sister in Christ falling into sin or even falling away from the Savior? Well, thankfully, Paul tells us exactly what we are to pursue in these instances restoration, which he explains quite thoroughly in just this one verse we read, starting with the when of restoration. So he says again, brothers, 
Sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. Now, the, the Greek word translated caught here in the ESV, it can also be translated overtaken. And it commonly designated one who has been overtaken or overpowered by surprise. And in this case, it's anyone, that is any fellow Christian, any fellow brother or sister in Christ, who has been suddenly overtaken, overpowered, Paul says, by any transgression. Now, a transgression is literally a false step. Or it pictures uh, crossing over a line or are deviating from a path. And it's a common word used in the New Testament for sin. And I think this is a very appropriate word to use, especially here for unexpected sin in a believer of Christ, who instead of walking by the Spirit, as instructed in chapter 5, verse 16, has taken a misstep, has deviated from the path of Scripture, and has begun walking in the flesh, as was described earlier in chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, where Paul says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. How easy it is to get caught up in those works of the flesh and many other transgressions. As Paul's use of the word any shows, there are countless ways we can be overtaken by sin. It's not just a list of, you know, 10 or 20 ways. No, there's multiple ways we can transgress. We can uh, be tripped up and deviate from the path of God's word. Now, our intention can be to steer clear of sin We want to stay on the righteous path. But as this first part reminds us, how speedily and how surprisingly we can veer off from the narrow way. Right? We we weren't running after sin, but it almost seems like sin ran after us. And before we knew it, it, it overtook us. It caught us like in a snare. Surely the most infamous Biblical example of this is the sin of David with Bathsheba, sin that he confessed in that Psalm 51 that was read earlier. We read in 2 Samuel 11 that the king, he was just simply taking a nap on the rooftop. He he woke up, he started to walk around. Uh, That was very common in that time and in that place. And out of nowhere, as he's walking around, he sees this beautiful woman taking a bath. And just like that, Without premeditation, he is overtaken by sin. And he calls for this woman to come. He commits adultery with her. And of course, the rest is history. David was caught in that transgression. And it's something that can happen to believers today as well. Which is, first of all, the when of restoration. This is when restoration needs to happen. Well, that takes us to the second part of this instruction here and to the the who of restoration. So again, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, that's the when, the context, you who are spiritual should restore him. So when a brother or sister is overtaken by sin, who should step up and do something? A select few people, maybe the pastor, Maybe the elders, maybe those who have had some special training on how to do this. No, Paul says, it's you who are spiritual. Which is simply a reference to any Christian in any church who is walking by the Spirit. As Paul instructed again earlier in chapter 5, verse 16, and also verse 25. All right? so, so any believer who is dedicated to God depending on his power, and directed by his word. That person will have a a spiritual mindset and motivation to address sin in a godly 
way. And therefore, that is the person who is to seek restoration. Paul writes elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 15, that the things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned. And the spiritual person, that is the person who's simply walking by the Spirit each day, judges all things. He can see clearly what's going on from a a biblical perspective and therefore can address the problem in a godly way. Now, another way of describing those who are suited for restoration is simply to say strong Christians who are spiritually fit due to their training in the word and prayer and Christian fellowship. Romans 15.1 says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, church, this means that most of us, most of the time, are called to this mutual ministry. If we are believers who are simply each day taking one step further in our progress of sanctification, we're we're seeking to grow, we're we're walking by the Spirit, we're, we're walking in His Word, it is we then who are to fulfill this mutual ministry. This is for you. To carry out when you see a fellow believer, a brother or sister in Christ, caught in any transgression. After all, if you don't seek their restoration, maybe no one else will. Now someone will say, but but it's too hard to do. I, I just can't do that. I'm not outgoing. I'm not bold. I'm too scared. What if what if they respond poorly? What if they think that even though I come humbly, they think I'm being arrogant or judgmental? Or That's just not what we do nowadays in churches. It's it's not culturally appropriate. It doesn't seem polite. It seems, you know, we could go on and on all of the reasons why we might not do this. And why we would say, well, I understand that I'm being called to this, but I just can't do it. Well, that's true. You and I cannot do it on our own. But thankfully, we are not on our own. As we see throughout the book of Galatians, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, and he can do through us anything God asks us to do, anything God requires, which means there really is no excuse. You are the who of restoration, and so am I. You who are spiritual, restore him. Well, that takes us thirdly then to the the what of restoration, the matter at hand. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. Now, that Greek word translated restore here, it was commonly used in the first century as a surgical term for setting a bone or joint in order to restore its function. That's a great image, isn't it? Uh, It was also used for fishermen repairing nets, politicians restoring order, and workers rebuilding walls. And it basically means to put in order or to restore to a former condition. And that's a fitting term to describe the restoration to, to spiritual health and faithfulness from someone who's fallen into sin or fallen away from the Savior, as is in view here, okay? Paul is calling here the spiritually strong to come alongside of those who've been tripped up by sin and to do what's necessary to get them back on their feet and restore them to the path of righteousness. Now, this corresponds with the first step of church discipline that Jesus gave in Matthew 18, where he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Very similar to what Paul is saying here. But it also complements what we read elsewhere in the New Testament about responding to backsliders. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's from James 5, 19 to 20. Uh, Jude 22:23 says something similar. 
and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And then 2 Corinthians 13.11 actually uses the same word as is used here for restore. There, Paul says, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So church, as we consider our text today and these and really others, we can't escape this mutual ministry that we have all been given as spiritual Christians, those who are walking by the Spirit, to privately and prayerfully bring back wandering brothers and sisters to the way of Christ. Something that John Stott has helpfully explained this way. I found this really helpful. He says, if we detect somebody doing something wrong, we are not to stand by doing nothing on the pretext that it's none of our business and we have no wish to be involved, nor are we to despise or condemn him in our hearts. And if he suffers for his misdemeanor, say, serves him right or let him stew in his own juice, nor are we to report him to the minister or gossip about him to our friends in the congregation. No, we are to restore him, to set him back on the right path. This is how Luther applies the command, Martin Luther, run unto him and reaching out your hand, raise him up again, comfort him with sweet words and embrace him with open Arms. I think that's a real helpful, vivid picture of restoration, which is something I know I've had the privilege of, of seeing myself. Maybe you have too. And, and it's something that we, again, see all over the scriptures. The best example, of course, concerns the sudden surprising sin of David that I mentioned before. When Nathan, in 2 Samuel 12, you know the story, he, he came and he confronted the king. And he called the king to confess his sin, which he immediately did, leading to his restoration to the way of righteousness. In 2 Samuel 12, 13, after Nathan comes and addresses David, we read that David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. What a beautiful example. And again, we can go to Psalm 51 and just see that restoration. But there's actually another good biblical example right here in the book of Galatians, where Paul rebuked and we assume then restored the apostle Peter from his sin of hypocrisy in Galatia. So if you go back to chapter 2, we read this in verse 11 to 14. This is uh, Paul recording how he sought to restore Peter to the way of righteousness. Uh, Galatians 2, 11 to 14. But when Cephas, that's another name for Paul, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. That is, those who said, you must follow the old covenant law and have circumcision to be saved. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? That is another good example of what restoration is all about. Again, it's, it's doing what's necessary to help those who've been tripped up by sin back to their feet and onto the path of righteousness. Well, there's still a bit more here in this verse. We can go on to see that Paul also tells us the way of restoration. So back in Galatians 6 verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him, notice, in a spirit of gentleness. 
You know, it seems to me that restoration is so badly neglected today because honestly, many Christians have seen it so badly attempted. Most often with a spirit of pride that inevitably harms rather than helps. Like the religious leaders, as we see throughout the Gospels, who routinely pointed out the sins of others with self-righteous hypocrisy. Not to help their brothers, but rather to hype up themselves. They had more concern for their own well-being than the well-being of others. And that appeared to be a problem in the church in Galatia, too. As we read in chapter 5, verse 15, and then also verse 26. So in 5.15, we read about what was going on there, some of the sinful motivations and attitudes. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you were not consumed by one another. There was pride and arrogance and uh, competition towards one another. But then we see in verse 26, which is the verse right before our text today, Paul says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. How easy it is to to treat one another like that in the church. Relating to one another more as foe than family. Being harsh rather than helpful. And so Paul qualifies his call for restoration. He insists it must be done in a spirit of gentleness. Which of course is a fruit of the spirit. As we saw earlier in chapter 5, 22 to 23, where Paul says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So when we walk by the Spirit, we will have the fruit of gentleness in our lives. We won't beat a backslidden brother over the head with our Bibles but rather will gently and graciously address his sin from the word of God. Not from my opinion. Well, I don't think you should be doing that. I'm concerned about you, but let's let's humbly together look at what the scriptures say and, and, and express our concern, you know, that you've wandered from this path and I'm concerned about your spiritual well-being. Gently like that. Humbly speaking the truth in love, as Paul said in Ephesians 4, 15. That is how we are to seek restoration. English pastor Robert Chapman once came upon a man who was under church discipline for a sin that he refused to repent of. And he had vowed he would never have anything to do with that church and that pastor ever again. But as these two men one day were walking towards each other on the street, Chapman came and embraced the man. And he gently said to him, my dear brother, God loves you. Christ loves you. I love you too. Well, the man was completely taken back by this loving care and concern. And it broke down the man's hatred. And he repented there of this sin and was restored to the path of righteousness and to right fellowship in the church. I'm reminded of what Paul instructs in 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26 that says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. That is the way of restoration. It is to be done in a spirit of gentleness, in humility, in love. Well, that takes us to the final part then of this text, of this instruction, where we finally see the warning of restoration. Paul ends, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So what Paul's doing here is To help us treat our backslidden brothers and sisters gently, Paul concludes by warning that if we don't keep watch over ourselves, right, if we don't pay close attention to our own walk, we may soon be the ones who are tripped up and tempted by sin and falling into any kind of transgression, right? So today, You might be the one restoring, but tomorrow you might be the one who needs restoration. 
After all, the remaining sin nature, what Paul calls the flesh, it is warring within each of us. As we see in chapter 5, 17, where Paul said, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now with that perspective, that that's the war going on in every single one of us, that certainly changes our perspective when we're seeking to restore fellow Christians, doesn't it? It means that we should be restoring them knowing that I could just as easily fall. So I therefore must treat him as I would want him to treat me if I was the one falling into sin. Gently, humbly, in love. Just as Jesus taught in Matthew 7, 5. He says, first take out the log of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck in your brother's eye. Moody once said, I've had more trouble with D.L. Moody than with anyone else. He is my worst enemy. I've had no time to throw stones at others. Too much trouble with my own pride and conceit. Church, it's only with that kind of humble attitude, recognizing our own sin first, that our attempts at restoration will be faithful and fruitful. When we, as Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, first take heed of ourselves, lest we fall. I'm willing to humbly do this for you because I need you to someday most likely humbly do this for me. It's a mutual ministry, right? In fact, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to restore you because I hope if I was in this situation, if I had been caught in any transgression, you would do the same that you would do whatever it takes to restore me to the path of righteousness. That's the mutual ministry of restoration, the heart of it. The question is then, are we willing to do whatever it takes to humbly restore one another when we need it? On April 15th, 2019, the Cathedral of Notre Dame caught on fire during renovations. You probably remember the story. And after burning for 15 hours, it was severely, severely damaged. Well, immediately calls for the cathedral's restoration were made and donations flooded in. One family pledged $113 million to help repair this religious historical landmark. Well, this year, 2021, restoration finally began. And with hopes that restoration would happen by the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris. Although full restoration of the building is estimated to take 15 years and cost anywhere from one to eight billion dollars. An astronomical price that the French government and many faithful Roman Catholics are nevertheless willing to pay. Now, as I read about that a few weeks ago, I couldn't help but wonder, should we not be willing to put the same amount of time and energy and effort and resources into restoring our backslidden brothers and sisters in Christ, one another, to righteousness? I mean, should we not care infinitely more about the spiritual restoration of eternal souls than those who care about the physical reconstruction of a temporal building? Church, as we we walk together on the narrow way, following Jesus through this life, right? As Bunyan painted the picture, pilgrims on the journey on this spiritually dangerous path to the celestial city. Surely, when when one of our brothers or sisters in Christ walking with us suddenly is tripped up by sin and and starts wandering off the path of righteousness, surely we will want to go and and help them, won't we? 
right? We won't callously leave them behind, you know, shrug our shoulders. What a shame they wandered off. Or we won't spread around the news that they've fallen, hoping maybe someone else will do it. Well, we're standing right there next to them and we're in the best position to want to restore them. Or worse, we won't ridicule them before others, right? Shooting our own wounded, as the saying goes. No, in, in love, we'll, we'll offer our hand to our fallen brother, right? We'll want to gently address their transgression and, and call him to repentance in love and humility and offer to help him back up and help him onto the righteous path and, and walk side by side with him until he's fully restored to following Jesus again. Now, sure, he may not accept our help. He might even resent it. But this is our spiritual duty as Christians, nonetheless. And when we do it with the same love that Christ has shown us, the love that led to our redemption through the cross where he brought us onto that path of righteousness and made us considered righteous, justified through his sacrifice, Surely when we show that same kind of love, we can have peace that however my wandering brother or sister reacts, I know I've done what God has called me to do in gentleness and humility and genuine loving concern. And I know God is pleased with that. There is such a freedom when we step out in faith and do this out of care and concern, even when it goes badly. Because there's no qualification here. No, well, do this for one another unless you're certain it's going to go bad. No, Paul is clear. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you also be tempted. That's the mutual ministry of restoration, what it's meant to be, which is one of the most needful, but sadly, most neglected ministries in the church today, in modern times. Sadly, it seems we'd sooner restore broken buildings at whatever cost than restore backslidden brothers and sisters in Christ. But I hope and trust that will change or start to change here today amongst us at Church of the Open Bible as we commit to serving one another in this way and in every member ministry, doing whatever it takes to gently restore one another when we've fallen off the righteous way. Let's pray for God's help as we do this. Father, first of all, we're thankful for your grace and we're thankful that through Jesus Christ, though we were wandering, walking away from you in our sin, headed to the city of destruction, you got a hold of us. You revealed to us the gospel of your life, death, and resurrection for our sin. And when we put our faith in you, you redeemed us from sin and you set us now onto this pathway of righteousness so that We can live for you and your glory and live in the love of Christ on our way to the celestial city, to glory. Lord, we thank you. It's all by your grace. And it's all because, Jesus, you are a gentle Savior who has called us to come to you for rest. And who has taken upon uh, that yoke which we carry as disciples to bear it with us and help us through this life. And you've given us your spirit so that we can do what is impossible for us to do on our own. So I pray, Lord, as we consider all of that, we consider the gospel, we would go and do likewise for one another. We would seek to restore one another when we've fallen into sin or fallen away from you, our Savior. And we do it with the same gentleness, the same love, the same servant hearts, that we'd be walking by the Spirit so we can be spiritually minded Christians who can help each other in this and many other ways as we seek to be a church that has an every member ministry. And we pray this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Together in spirit, in faith.
I just want to conclude uh, again with uh, this encouraging benediction from the book of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to his power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.